today is August 15th. We are at the Finksburg Library. Uh, my name is Sherry Taylor and we are talking with Dick Weaver. Um, so Dick, tell me, you are fourth generation farm family. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay, uh, <clears throat> my family uh, after the Civil War actually moved into Finksburg area. Um, <clears throat> a great grandfather uh, purchased some property there. I'm the fourth generation uh, on that property. My sons are the fifth and uh, we are just had our first granddaughter here in the area so we're hopefully to continue that. So uh, we're a small uh, farming operation in uh, Finksburg. We uh, raise corn, soybeans, hay, and Angus cattle. Um, this is um, <clears throat> something we used to grow a lot of produce and as my sons got older decided that was not the way they wanted to go. It was too labor intensive and they wanted to do things that uh, could be done mechanically. So we shifted more back to traditional agriculture and uh, that's where we are today with this and uh, we encompass not quite 400 acres there that we uh, operate and um, the uh, Angus cattle are our main or in feed fed cattle or our main uh, op part of the operation. Now did you always have cattle or when did you end that? Oh, we've always had some cattle and you start looking at um, agriculture as it evolved. My great-grandfather and my father's told me he would uh, take about uh, take a horse and a plow and he could get through an acre a day and today that would be in plowing if you're using a chisel plow or something it probably 10, 15 minutes tops to do what it took him all day to do. Uh, so yeah, it was always cattle on the operation, but not the same as we have it today. It was every, and I'll uh, get back to that in a minute, but uh, first of all, everybody had a cow or two cows, and it was kind of what we call today sustainable agriculture, where everybody raised a few chickens, everybody had a cow or two, a milk cow, they had whatever, maybe some rabbits, uh, geese, or whatever, and that's how they fed the family. Um, today, uh, and th as things evolve now, you uh, produce a number of animals to wind up um, selling those products, and it was like uh, years ago, everybody had one milk cow. Well, they added two or three, they had excess milk, so they would put it in a, a milk can, put it in a lo local spring, uh, kept it cool, it was taken to Baltimore, wherever the creamery was, and everybody shipped the excess milk. Some people started adding more and more cows as they started adding uh, family members. They could milk 12, 14, 15, 20. And as we got into, um, I guess after World War II, uh, electrification of the area came about and rural electrification, uh, milkers and compressors started happening. So those cows then went to 50, 100. And we have uh, some herds in the county now of uh, a thousand. Uh, in New Windsor, I know we have one with a thousand cows, still a lot of 200 cow operations. So uh, it became specialized. Uh, we did the same thing with beef cattle. We tried to stay uh, totally integrated as much as possible. Everything we produce goes back into the cattle and cattle are the product we sell, uh, lean meat. Uh, if you look at agriculture as uh, way we um, produce things, uh, people cannot eat, digest grass very easily, um, and we can take uh, a ruminant, put that grass through them and produce a protein that is uh, good for human consumption or uh, better for human consumption, and that's our major focus at the present time, produce that animal uh, that uh, is for human consumption. Now. When we get back to, you know, that farm was small like all other farms in the area and we probably farm what 10 people made a living on 50 years ago. And we can do it part time. So that gets, uh, you know, with, with the equipment, the size of the equipment coming in, the technologies coming into agriculture, we can now do what uh, 10 families made a living on and we can do that part time so when you were growing up what was a typical day like on the farm when you were young I mean much different than today but what was it like then oh wow well growing up I um, got involved in 4-H pretty heavily at about the age of 11 and um, I like swine and got a little over 
a little carried away with them. And my day started usually, I don't know, 6.30, 7 o'clock. I uh, had cattle, we either grinding feed, feeding cattle, taking care of uh, the farrowing house where they had little ones or whatever. Um, then we always had either hay to bale, and this was the small square bales. Uh, years ago, it was loose hay put into the barn and took a group of people to move that hay. Then at that time, it was the small square bales, and they were labor intensive. And from the time you were 13 or 14, uh, people my age in the community, we helped everybody. Uh, you were all with the guys stacking the wagon off the baler, or you were the ones packing the hay into the barn. And uh, I know, I, I guess we just didn't know any better at the time, but spent a lot of uh, time in the top of a barn, 120 degrees, uh, uh, kind of covered with chaff or whatever, packing hay in, a, uh, in the barn. And everybody in the community, worked for somebody or moved to the next farm and we all helped uh, pack hay. And usually uh, you didn't have to worry about sleeping. You were plenty tired at the end of the night. And um, uh, I remember my mother was a fantastic cook and some of the uh, people we helped, the meals were unbelievable and it shows. But uh, the lunch noon meal was huge at that time. So we spent a lot of time uh, on the farm and it off times you were always repairing or painting or doing something that needed to be done so you grew up always keeping busy. Now I think a, a lot of people weren't familiar with farms you know think about the fact that you have you know you're growing grain or you're growing you know, have livestock but a farmer really needs to know a lot of different trades. Tell me a little bit about it. Well at one time Agriculture is mostly vocational. You learned everything from uh, uh, carpenter trades, plumbing, electrical, uh, welding, a uh, little bit about everything because you had to to keep up to keep things going. And as technology has changed today, it's sort of like the automobile or anything else, um, farming has become much more specialized. And as you get some of the family farms growing, usually one member focuses more on the uh, maintenance of machinery, another one focuses more on the production of crops, one in uh, maybe crop protectants or into the livestock or whatever. So, And they almost have to be because it's so complicated to that today with all the uh, <clears throat> all things happening uh, as far as uh, uh, the new tier four engines and the new uh, technologies into them and just to keep up with it all uh, one person has a rough time uh, doing, uh, doing that and doing it well. Um, keep in mind though, there's still a, kind of a jack of all trades and anybody's capable almost doing anything as far as uh, uh, agriculture and you have, if you don't have the answer, you have to know who to go to to get the answer and to get the uh, product finished where you need to, need to have it uh, or your broken down in the field somewhere, you need to make the phone call to get the right people there with the right equipment to make get it fixed and up and running again. So that's kind of where we are in agriculture today. Well, you talk about, you know, it sounds like a lot of the technology has made it many aspects of farming easier. What is it though about you know, the good old days that you might miss? Nothing. <laughs> Actually, um, the good old days, <laughs> you probably had a slower pace. Uh, you weren't as pushed to cover as much acreage in a, uh, as fast a time. And as I said, we probably didn't know any better. That was the best technology at that time for what we were doing. You look back on it, and it was like, wow, it was relaxed. It was not the, the tempo or the pace we have today in things, um, yet it was, more labor intensive. So yes, you were worn out at the end of the day, whereas today, if you're doing anything even today like today, you know, you're in an air conditioned cab or a heated cab, you're, uh, you know, have the radio on while you're doing whatever, uh, watching a monitor do the work, and at the end of the day, you're just as clean as when you started most times, unless you have a problem. But um, where it used to be at the end of the day, you, you were tired. 
Um, so those type things have changed quite a bit. And yes, you spend a lot of time in uh, equipment, but you look at where we have come from and where we're going. Uh, I was just looking outside here today at the display. You know, we have a, a cub out here, a small tractor, which today is fine for a garden, but uh, you look at the 300 horsepower pieces of equipment uh, that we're running through fields, they can do what that tractor did, uh, what it took that tractor all day to do, they can do in probably a half an hour. Uh, so, yes, we have changed. Uh, it's continuously evolving, and the technology is fast and furious uh, in agriculture. It is to the point today that uh, a person really needs, they need a good education in agri-science, agri-technologies. Uh, it's not you just get out, drop out of school, start on a farm, milk cows or whatever. Even milking cows, the technology is it's become uh, robots milking the cows today. Uh, a lot of them, the, the person fixing the computer system is more valuable than the person monitoring the cows today. So agriculture has totally evolved and is continuously evolving. What are some of the stories um, that maybe your father shared with you about what things were like when he started on the family farm? Ah. A little bit about the history, going, going back a little farther. Well, he has a problem with the, well, being 95 now, he is uh, a little bit of a problem adjusting uh, to some of the newer things happening. Um, and some of the things my boys do, he just does not understand at all where they're going and how they're going to get there. Uh, questions everything. Uh, even though he doesn't understand the answers of what they're giving him, but he still questions why they're doing that uh, or where they think they're going to go with it. And they're looking at a bigger picture down the road somewhere, um, and they're using a computer to guide them. They're using all kind of different technologies, and he's still back to uh, thinking about a horse and plow or whatever, looking at it from that point of view. Um, and if there's a hard way to do it, he finds it. Now, I'm told I'm just as bad sometimes. I don't uh, look for the easier way to do things. But as we evolved uh, from his farms growing, uh, we've got away from manual labor. Uh, small square bales no longer exist. Uh, we may have a few. We get to feed heifers or something. But most of it is large bales today and can all be handled with a skid loader or a front end loader. You're not um, handling anything by hand anymore. It's mostly operation of equipment. And even if you look at the equipment in the larger operations today, you don't even need to, a manned piece of equipment. Um, uh, the combines, if you notice, they all have a unload while they're going through a field. The fields are large enough. Today, you can, from the combine cab, take control of the tractor and the wagon, bring it up next to the combine, lock it in, it stays right with it, unload the combine, turn control back over to the operator, and they can move away and unload that uh, grain cart so they don't have to um, have the uh, skills that they once had. It's, it's all done through the, uh, from the operator of the, the combine system. If you look at um, some of the auto steer technologies and GPS, we have, uh, once you map out the field, it's gps you know exactly where you are. Uh, some of the sprayer booms with 90, 90 feet coverage at a time, you're accurate within one inch going across the field and you're monitoring it on the computer screen. You know if a spot is missed and that can be uh, picked up very easily. So, uh, How was that done before all that? Before that, they had foam markers. If you dropped foam and had to stay on it or before that, it was kind of a, a guess uh, method, but you look at the efficiency in this. Before, if you lapped and could cause some damage, too much uh, spray or whatever, today you only put on what is needed, and that is monitored. You can even take uh, the information from that the harvest has, take that information, plug it into the crop protectants, and you only put on what's needed in different areas of the field as far as nutrients, as far as any chemicals used. So they're monitored, they're efficiently put on, you only not 
uniformly everywhere. You only put on what's needed in each different soil type, each different area of the field. So um, in the mapping of that, uh, and today you, everybody has a nutrient management plan that every field is soil tested, every uh, yield is monitored everywhere within that field. You can map the change in the yields and um, really uh, go back and start to map out what's needed in each area of the field so that you don't put too much on, you put in more on where it's needed, goes from there. Uh, back to um, uh, my grandfather, they used to plant corn in 40 inch squares. So they would cultivate both ways and have one stalk at every 40 inch square. And they, uh, I've seen the planters, they had a line with a knot in it, it would click when the seed dropped every 40 inches, but they had to cultivate everything. And the yields were maybe 40, 50 bushel an acre. When I was growing up, 100 bushel an acre is what everybody was striving for because we started to put in rows. And that was 38, 40 inch rows of corn. Today that's dropped down to 30, 15 inch rows, sometimes double cropping. But 200 bushel is something you're looking for, the yield uh, on that. And if we start looking at the um, Yields, it's not uncommon to see yields bumping 300 bushel in some spots uh, by yield monitors. You won't get a whole field probably that way. And this is non-irrigated areas. Irrigated areas, they're striving for 400 bushel corn in the United States, from 40 to 400 bushel. Now, it, why is that needed? Because by 2040, I think the world's population is going to hit 9 billion people. How are they going to eat? somebody's going to have to feed them. In the United States, where everybody used to have their own little sustainable farm, now we have about 2% of the population producing 80% of the uh, cr crops or producing 80% of the food, and this is almost a worldwide market that we're in. So you're looking at agriculture to feed the world. And with that comes some concessions. Uh, we start looking at, uh, depending on agriculture to feed uh, nine billion people here, uh, and this is worldwide. How are we going to do that? Yield has to keep going up. If you look locally, uh, we have a problem. Some of the best farmland in the country is from central Virginia through center, center of Pennsylvania. If you look what we're doing to it, we're developing a lot of our best productive ground so that we have to balance uh, preserved land, we have to balance growth, and we have to look at um, still producing the food that is needed. And, uh, and it gets to be a little tough today. You look at the size of the equipment. You go down the road and there's a combine taking up three quarters of the road. Some people get upset with it. A lot of people simply wait very patient and uh, will work with people to get down the road. But it's very difficult to move equipment and uh, work with the homeowner and get through uh, everything today. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back again, you know, and okay. kind of focus in the past a little bit. Um, you said the farm that you're on now, back in the day could have actually, you know, housed up to 10 families. I mean, 10 farms in the area that you work now. Tell me a little bit about some of the some of the families that were around you when you were growing up and your interactions with them and what they did as well and how that area has changed. Well, we live actually right across the road from where I was, uh, uh, where I grew up. And um, Jim Beam, James W. Beam, uh, lived there. I knew him and he was a little, uh, quite a bit older, like a grandfather to me almost. Uh, everything I did, he was right there, and if something was off, he would, uh, and I'll give you an example, we were putting a building up, we had uh, studs, got a quarter inch off. I had to get something, and went away, I come back, the whole wall's knocked down. He said, now we're gonna do it right. Be right exact, had to be just so, and he helped me put it back, but uh, we have a lot of little things like that, and, uh, uh, but he was a perfectionist, he was a, kind of a carpenter betrayed, but uh, we live there now. When he um, was getting older, his wife passed away and had a family reunion, and he said, if anybody in the he, it was like 80 people, anybody in the family interested in the farm? If not, he wanted me to have it, or 
be able to buy it, and that happened. And uh, his oldest son, when he passed away, we purchased the farm, and that's where we live, in a nice little stone house at that point. Uh, there are all kinds of stories about all the people around uh, there. I'm not sure we can tell some of them on TV, but um, of all kinds of things. My father was telling about one that used to have a thrusting machine, went up the road, and they had coal that um, fired the machines. Well, they went up the road, it was a dirt road at that time, and some of the coals bounced out, caught some straw on fire, went up, burnt the one barn down. And that's how another barn was built there, a newer one, 1926. It was a newer one. But the, the caught fire and went through, and they never knew it, you know, in a, a steam engine at that time. But the whole community worked together. And he has story after story of people and, uh, you know, the the time their horse got out and, you know, ate the other guy's garden or whatever. And, you know, they just have community stories. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. The, uh, uh, I guess I, I know a lot of the grandchildren or the children of those people, and we, we all get along very well because we have a common heritage, and that's, that's a unique thing. And you have brothers and sisters? I have uh, one sister, and they farm on St. Paul Road, uh, deep run farms. Uh, they're totally vegetables, wholesale uh, vegetables, and uh, uh, their one son is taking that over more, and they, uh, they go, so I have 100 acres of uh, uh, quality vegetables, and pumpkins, sweet corn, tomatoes, and those type things. Now, was she involved? Did she get involved in 4-H when she was young as well? She was involved in 4-H also. We uh, grew up, great organization, by the way, to grow up with. Um, uh, Peg followed behind a little bit, and we kept her uh, going. But she, uh, she loved her horses and through 4-H and still has two. In fact, uh, she took my father horseback riding just about a month ago. And one of the things on his bucket list, he wanted to go horseback riding again. And she was in Colorado, and they bought two horses that were on a dude ranch that you could do anything with. Uh, and she has them uh, here in Hampstead, and she, uh, they have a picture of him on this horse, and they went ride, trail riding and handled it very well. So uh, no problems at all. So. Already stopped. <laughs> what... Um what do you think it is about farming that has kept four generations in this field? Well, part of it, I think, is uh, you develop a love of animals. You love the land, and um, even my boys, I mean, they we questions where they want to go, and oh, don't get rid of anything. We want to keep it, and uh, they're part of it, and that's kind of... I guess the, uh, they developed the same love of things that I had. And I think you have to be there, you have to grow up with it to really get to that point. Yet a lot of people later in life find uh, they love uh, beekeeping or they love parts of it and they get involved on it. But it's something I think you grow up with, it becomes part of your culture, part of your background, and, uh, and you have a tendency to have a lot of friends with the same background, so it... Uh, uh, it's contagious is what it amounts to. And we first got married. My wife uh, basically grew up in Nashua, New Hampshire, do nothing about agriculture. And it was um, the gentleman I was telling you about, Mr. Beam, uh, referred to her, or referred to my wife Lila as her. Never called her by name for about three years. Uh, and one of my uh, boys were in 4 H, and she was helping him. Uh, comb the tail out and never thought I'd see her do that and all of a sudden she worked her way in then it was Lila and uh, became very fond of her but she had it took her about seven eight years to work into being okay in the community so uh, it, that you know it's just the way that evolves but uh, and she uh, has evolved too totally from I'm not touching that. To, okay, how are we going to do it? <laughs> so, do, do you think the farm just does that to people? Do you think farming just does that to people? I think it does too. I mean, it's the type thing. You have to get things done. There's no one to rely on. You don't call somebody. You do it. 
So it's that sense of urgency. The fact is, whatever, what do we have to do? How are we going to do it? And that happens. I don't care what size operation is, whether it's a, uh, rabbits in 4-H or a couple kids or whether it's 10,000 acres out here, how are you going to get it done and who's going to do it when and where and you just attack with a problem. Um, that's one reason I think a lot of uh, kids with an agricultural background do never have any problem finding employment. Uh, they have a work ethic, uh, they don't quit, and they just get the job done. And that's where I think a lot of employers uh, enjoy that type background. What do you think the future is for maybe the families that do have the smaller farms still? Okay, now, if you look at the future, as I said, technology is coming in big time in agriculture. So that one worker in production agriculture probably has 50 people supporting him. Plant research, uh, animal research, uh, all kind of genetic research going on, um, embryos in cattle, uh, uh, cloning, it's basically the same type thing, uh, <clears throat> coming about. We look at the... Uh, uh, crops and all the research going on with those uh, genetically modified organisms and that's a whole controversy within itself but we're looking at this that that is a, a protein a DNA strand that is shot into a plant that uh, you have the ability now to spray Roundup over it and Roundup's a product that Everybody's using around their home to kill weeds in the uh, sidewalk or whatever. It has the toxicity of table salt to people. Uh, relatively safe. There's no residual to it. But we have plants that we can now spray Roundup over the field. That's the only chemical you really need to use. And kills all the weeds. And at that point, we've now cut the cost of production down. And the research going into this, the people... Uh, working in those areas, have to, numbers have to go up to get those, uh, whether it's the spray rigs, whether it's the sales, all those areas. There's opportunity, and a, a lot of opportunity for kids that have some agricultural background, and not don't have to have large background, but they have some background. They usually have to have a degree or an associate degree anyway, and those companies are picking them up like crazy. And there is a lot of opportunity in agriculture uh, in the future. Some of it we don't even know about yet. But uh, here again, I mentioned the, just the mechanics in the engines, uh, in these tractors, and the efficiency they're coming up, uh, coming up with, and the lack of emissions that are put out by them anymore. But the technology in, those, in that machine is so advanced that we really need um, uh, college-trained mechanics to handle it and this is where it's opportunity for that student or kid that didn't have the opportunity to go into farming. For the others, still in some production, some of the farms grow and they just keep growing and growing to the point that they can support three or four families and many of them, we, or they call them corporate farms, but they're extended family farms is what it amounts to. Well, it sounds like they're you said growing, there are more opportunities within, within farming. What is the one thing or a few things that you hope doesn't get lost um, or it's been carried through all these generations? Um, is, there, is there a tradition or a quality or something that you hope uh, remains even as technology and, and things evolve? Well, you know, you have to look at history so that you don't repeat your mistakes and things in history and I look at um, the farm museum you had Jeff Graff with his uh, cradle uh, taking weed off a couple of weeks ago and he learned that from his father how to do it and uh, I think they did a half hour demonstration they were probably played out at the end of that uh, but you have to understand where you came from before you know where you're going and I hope they don't lose the uh, feeling of you know, to tradition, what their forefathers did to get to where they are. I mean, it's very nice to jump into a half million dollar combine and, and there's all the bells and whistles and you can fly through the field at seven miles an hour and harvest grain and you're doing in, as I said, five minutes what it took them all day to do. 
but you need to know how it evolved. You need to know how that machine evolved, what, what the purpose is, how it runs, what makes it tick and everything so it can be set for maximum efficiency. So I hope that doesn't get lost. The other thing uh, is the work ethic that goes into it, that you start a job, well, you, sorry, we're not, we don't end at four o'clock, we, we work until the job's finished. And sometimes that's one or two o'clock in the morning, and uh, or you start it early in the morning on before the ground thaws out or whatever to get things done. Um, also, just back up a moment as we um, move. I said the technology technologies, the accountability farmers have today with nutrient management, with the bay and those things, there's a host of opportunities there with people with writing nutrient management plans, the soil testing, uh, all the things that go into that, um, uh, keeping the farmer going. And those, tech, those things uh, are a host of jobs and opportunities for them that weren't here 15 years ago. And it's expanding throughout the country as we move to the uh, Ohio River Valley, the Mississippi uh, River. They're doing the same in those areas as we are with the Chesapeake Bay. So th across the country, there's opportunities. And every time there's a change, there's an opportunity. And you look at it, it may not be the same uh, as your parents did, but it's an opportunity to move on and stay within the agriculture world. And it's, uh, it's changing, but you have to change with it. Thank you.